led by Yarinda Bunak and Roberto Roquejo. Imaginary Objects is a design studio that pursues the realization of transformative environments. The firm is known for putting together distinctive objects to make out of the box ideas of form and space that are flexible and adaptable. That said, today we have Roberto uh, with us to converse about uh, the topic of objects that make space. So thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for inviting me. Looking forward to the conversation. Perfect. So can you tell us first about your studio? Yeah, so uh, Yarinda and I uh, started the studio back in 2018, and it was a time of transition for us. Um, I was sort of leaving my, my full-time uh, job at uh, OMA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture in Hong Kong, and I was uh, starting to teach full-time at Hong Kong University. Uh, and Yarenda essentially had this idea, she sort of approached me about it, uh, to start a, an office together. She was also transitioning from being a design director at Hypothesis to essentially starting her own operation. Um, so she approached me with the idea and, and we were both very excited and willing to, to start something new together in a way uh, as an office. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how it started. Uh, but obviously me being based in Hong Kong and her being uh, based in Bangkok, it required a little bit of travel and whatnot, uh, which for me was great to be able to go to Bangkok uh, often. Um, and I think that aspect in a way informed very much the way that we communicated. Uh, the practice has become very much uh, virtual. Mm -hmm. and the presentations are quite kind of seamlessly integrated uh, online. We use a lot of uh, uh, online uh, platforms uh, to collaborate uh, and the team as well. And so how would you describe your design philosophy? Yeah, well, uh, you introduced uh, earlier uh, this idea of objects. Um, I, I, I would say that we, we, we do think that every project is different and unique, right? So. Um, our, our approach is very responsive to the conditions that you find um, in a way. But in parallel to that, we also think that it's important to have a kind of um, driving force or a driving philosophy that keeps the work somehow consistent and that keeps the work uh, in this condition where it's trying to achieve something that you think is important. Um, so this idea of objects, um, has uh, some benefits, uh, let's say. I think uh, projects can often be uh, challenging, right? And sometimes these challenges are so unsurmountable. Uh, the object philosophy comes from the idea that uh, any sort of unsurmountable challenge can always be broken down into kind of much more manageable elements, right? Mm -hmm. And when you sort of break down a big problem into small, smaller problems, um, then you have a greater control uh, uh, over it. Uh, and you can also give each one of those elements somehow a greater attention. I think the result is also that the project ends up being quite diverse, right? Mm -hmm. That if you design a sort of, let's say you design a museum, that you, if you think of it more as, you know, as a sequence of different spaces and each one of those spaces kind of has its own identity or approach or it's given different attention, the project becomes kind of really, really rich. Uh, and of course, it can be spaces and they can be objects in a way, a space and an object and can have a relationship and objects also, space in between objects can also constitute the quality um, of, of our designs. Uh, but yeah, objects, by, uh, you know, for us are quite important, not just because of this idea of breaking things down into manageable exercises, but also because um, you know, there's an important element in architecture that are, it's about encountering a space. So architecture can be quite vis visual and tactile, that in a way can be like an object. You know, it's not just a void that is also a thing you know, that you can touch and feel and sometimes even climb on. Mm -hmm. So I know you did mention it, that like you can break a problem down to parts. You approach it from like a smaller scale. 
more manageable solutions than the group to bigger ones, but how exactly do you make a transformative environment? Does it always come from a need or a problem or it comes naturally with all design? Yeah, I think, um, well, I mentioned how um, this idea of breaking down things into smaller parts can also create richness. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the richness through diversity, right? Um, we, we think essentially that uh, trying to seek uh, alternatives that are maybe unexpected um, can, can bring that kind of diversity and richness to a space. So it's not just, you know, in a very mechanical way, taking a big problem and breaking it down into pieces, but it is about looking at those pieces and saying, well, you know, how has this been done before? How can we do it differently? Have we considered maybe designing uh, this kind of space in a different way, uh, different proportion, a different materiality? Could it work differently? Could the circulation work differently? Uh, so breaking down the big problem, the smaller problem also means that we can kind of really almost in a meditative fashion, kind of really, really pay attention to these spaces and not just mechanically solve problems, but definitely try to seek and find opportunities for how these spaces and these functions can just be operated, used uh, differently in a way. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's nice to know that, you know, objects can be so powerful and like significant in spatial context. Um, but how is it exactly in real life? Is it such intangible connection? Um, do we see it happening in real life? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe the easier way to, to sort of answer that question is through showing a project. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, uh, there are some playgrounds, for instance, that we've designed that I think are quite a kind of tangible representation of, of this philosophy in a way. Um, where essentially, you know, different uh, play structures are designed almost as kind of individual elements, right? Mm -hmm. And they are rich in the sense that they're quite accessible, that you can climb on them, that you can enter them, that you can sort of jump on them, swing from them, and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. And they, are a sort of inhabitable object in their own right. And they have a presence from the exterior that is distinct. So each object you could argue has a kind of different form and shape and a different function. And at the same time, equally as important is how the different objects are arranged in relationship to each other because this house, the outdoor space or the space in between the objects is kind of equally as significant. And, and I think that synthesis of the different objects arranged together as a sort of, you know, layout or master plan is also very much part of the contribution of, of, of the designs. Yeah, so this is a playground that we designed for a Buddhist school also. Um, and this is just a conceptual diagram essentially. Uh, but as you can see in a way, uh, the conceptual diagram is representative of uh, play objects or toys, in this case made out of wood, right? Uh, and each one of these in a way has a different um, form uh, and arguably they also have a different function. Uh, so this was sort of in a way the way that we kind of tend to initiate some of our designs. And of course they have a very low resolution because in this diagram it's unclear what they are. Um, they're just sort of massings. But obviously, through design development, uh, investigation, and also through responding to the needs of, of the client and the site, they kind of gain a higher level of resolution and they kind of retain their independence. But each one of them also gains their own material quality and their own spatial quality. Some are more open, some are more closed. Uh, some are integrated with, um, with vegetation why not? Um, and, you know, in a way, they all become um, objects that provide kind of a different experience and also a different function. Right? I think for me, this is quite important because in a way, these objects are not really solving a problem necessarily. 
it's more like they're expanding the opportunities of play, right? So what can you actually do when you're in it? And these are some of the ideas, of course, that we started with, but if you see some of these playgrounds um, in the actual site being used, you'll see the kids, and I'll show you some photographs later, that they also find their own ways of interacting with the structure that we may not have anticipated. Um, this is the site uh, where it was sort of constructed here on the lower right hand corner. Um, an elevated platform, which is also one of the challenges that we kind of encountered. It wasn't a playground type grade. Um, and essentially, this goes back a little bit to the idea that I was trying to introduce earlier, but it's not just about the objects and then developing the objects at a higher resolution, but it's also about how they can be arranged together. And of course, once they are arranged in a particular way, they tend to be kept uh, in, that, in that manner. But uh, how they are arranged was also not just part of our conversations in design, but also conversations with the client to find kind of the optimal, optimal relationship among them. And in principle, they could also be arranged in other ways, right? So there's a kind of degree of versatility that carries into the design from kind of the idea of the toy or the playful object. Um, and then maybe kind of the last aspect of it, you know, we have used the word transformative. You could also just say that it's about experience, but this kind of idea that it's a tactile space that there's kind of like interesting uh, play of light and material is also very kind of important for us. So, you know, in a way we prototype um, the outcome through visualization. And we kind of try to test and see how the object will be used, but also how it will be experienced. You know, that the spaces are not just kind of transactional and you get to the tower and then you take the slide, but that you can also kind of really enjoy being in the spaces so let me scroll quickly through some of these. And in this particular case, for instance, um, obviously we wanted to create this kind of sculptural mound, right? As a kind of stepped um, surface. Uh, but we thought of kind of integrating some vegetation on it initially and also finding the opportunity for it to be more versatile. That is not just kind of a stepped surface in the landscape, but it can also become kind of labyrinth. And this idea of kind of multiplicity or multiple use, again, trying to find opportunities, how else can we use it, begins to make it a bit more distinct. You know, you may have seen some play structures that are maybe similar to this one as a mound or climbable structure, but maybe not so many that become a labyrinth within it. You know? So the idea is always, how can we kind of deviate a little bit from the norm? Um, so these are images that we uh, developed and orchestrated uh, during the design process. And I'll show you now some images of the final outcome of the project. And I have to say that, you know, for us, it's quite satisfying to, to see um, how the kind of design process uh, is transformed when it becomes executed. You know, it's quite fulfilling to really see kids playing in, in the playground and to see them really enjoying the spaces, to really see somehow that the intended quality of light and material and tactile qualities kind of come across. And in some cases, you know, the actual implementation of the project becomes even uh, more successful than, than what we had imagined initially, right? Because there are also differences that come in to the uh, building process, you know, some details that come in through necessity through which we find opportunity. For instance, we never envisioned that this space, and it might seem so obvious, but we never envisioned that this would be an interior kind of climbing structure. We were interested mostly in the quality of light inside and kind of creating, you know, this volume, this accessible tower above it. But obviously, you know, the gap in between uh, the width members makes it quite uh, tangible and 
easy to grab and climb onto. So that's always very satisfying to kind of see the possibilities that people can come up with through the use of the objects that kind of transcend and sometimes exceed our expectations. And for us, in a way, it's kind of like a, it's a sort of research, you could argue, to actually deploy the objects, the playgrounds in this case, and see how people can kind of bring their own creative initiatives into them. Because then it helps us kind of learn from it and develop designs in the future that might kind of anticipate um, how these might be used. Nice. Yeah, I guess with a space that is active, you can constantly see frequently how people might have used it differently and like expand from its own original intentions that uh, the designers has initiated, right? And also this kind of demonstrate how designers should also be flexible and keep being flexible even when the project is done already because users might use it in a different way or might have different goals with the space. So, yeah, I yeah, think... Yeah, I totally agree. It's a, it's a bit of a partnership at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you guys reach out to us, the designers, but in a way, you know, the clients, the user, the designers, the contractors are all in a way kind of part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we can communicate it better, but, but that's about it. We're all kind of in it together. Yeah, I think as adapting is key because we might be designing for different age groups, different professions. So being open and staying collaborative is also very important. Yeah. Um, so when we zoom out a little bit, um, how do you foresee like spaces like this uh, connect with the other programs, maybe in urban levels with housing, with workplace, public space, and et cetera? Yeah, um, we, we have worked on master plans as well, actually. Uh, and the approach, you could argue, is somewhat similar. I mean, in this case, the objects are play structures, but they can also be buildings. Um, and of course, it's quite important, you know, what quality of space you create in between buildings. I think it's also important to keep sufficient amount of view corridors, sufficient amount of light, sufficient amount of ventilation. So at the urban level, it becomes even more critical because the consequences are more important. Uh, but in a way, thinking of urban plans and kind of urban volumes um, as objects that could contribute diversity and can define a space in between is, I think, absolutely necessary to create a, really livable spaces in the city because the alternative is in a way, you know, straight extrusions that are, you know, seamlessly repeated, creating in a way very kind of narrow, congested, and homogenous spaces on the streets that becomes primarily um, sort of conquered by the automobile, right? Um, so, I think if you think of, of buildings as, as objects and you think as much of the building as you think of the space in between, then you can definitely create much more livable uh, and accessible spaces, which you could argue, you know, is, is quite a challenge also in Asia, Southeast Asia in general, because the cities have grown so much so quickly mm. uh, that sometimes the development in a way compromises really the quality of the street. And it, you know, it's challenging because obviously we can think of a building as something that needs to be maybe executed because there's a need for it. But we have to think equally of the spaces in between that are a bit more difficult to grasp, you know, but those also need to have a quality. Right. You know, they need to, there need to be parks, there need to be pedestrian spaces, there need to be also programmed areas for play, for leisure. You know, for interacting with water in a way, you know, urban landscaping is equally as important as architecture and urbanism. Everything has to work together. Yeah, if, if you want, I can share a master plan that we worked on really quickly. Yeah. I'll just kind of show you a few uh, photos of a physical model, and I won't really explain the project, but mm -hmm. I think you'll be able to see in the photos mm -hmm. um, 
this kind of idea. So this is a master plan that we've worked on in Bangkok. And you could probably appreciate see this idea of the objects in the space, and how they can become distinct, and how the space in between them is also important to create a landscape, um, urbanism, new corridors, and in, in a way, just character in general. That's very nice. <laughs> Well, basically, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think we learned a lot today about how designers should stay flexible and stay nimble of, you know, like the challenges and the solutions that we put out there. Although we make spaces or we make objects, the effect is much larger than that. You know, like incentivizing people to do positive things. And that's one thing that we need to uh, be mindful about. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for having me. <laughs>